And um, I thought today what, what I would like to do is, is really go back a little bit and, and set the scene. I think sometimes we, we forget where we come from um, uh, with, with some of these uh, technologies. Um, and also often um, uh, interpretations are, um, are, are often forgotten as well. So I'm just going to give an overview of biological control. Um, and one of the things that we, we like to do as, as humans is we like to define things. And we can spend a lot of time, in fact, we can spend probably the next two days, if we would like to, defining exactly what biological control is. And we will put different emphasis in different areas, depending on, on where we come from. But suffice it to say, it's not about the definition of biological control that, to me, is important. It's about what the outcomes are. And the outcomes of biological control have to be that, in, in view of what we've just heard, in particular from, from Uli, that in some way we, we reduce the reliance that we have on, on, on pesticides. So define it how, how you wish, really. Um, but what we've, got to, what we've got to not lose focus of is, is the outcome. And the outcome is that we really need to reduce the amount of pesticides um, used in the world without affecting um, food security uh, where we can. Where, where we can. Um, really, you know, once again, going on to what, what, what Uli said earlier about bioprotection, and one of the things that um, concerns me sometimes when uh, I, I look at the what we would say some of the challenges to biological control in some areas of the world, not all areas of the world, but in some areas of the world, the, the almost reluctance to uptake um, is that it, it fits in with so many of the things that we're talking about in the world, whether it be um, uh, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, whether it be One Health, whether it be, um, as we've heard already, the, the, the Kungming Montreal um, biodiversity, um, building biodiversity. And so it, it really, um, uh, we, 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 biological control, to my mind, uh, fits all of these, all of these things. It's a, it's a nature-based solution. And we have different types of biological control. And in fact, what is really interesting is um, at dinner last night um, with um, several uh, very experienced biological control people, we, we were discussing these differences between what we would term classical, augmentative, classic um, conservation biological control, and, and whether they are distinct, and whether the lines between them are not, are not blurred, whether they're, they're one doesn't just feed um, into, into the other. So I, I really don't want us, over the next couple of days, to get hung up on, on, on these definitions, if, if at all possible. But we, we put biological control into these different blocks, um, augmentative biological control, uh, where we have these periodic releases of, of natural enemies um, in different areas. And once again, you can go through 100 different publications and you'll find 100 different uh, definitions of these. Uh, we have uh, conservation biological control, and this is the ultimate. The ultimate is where we protect the environment such that the environment um, uh, pr protects um, uh, uh, so some of what we want to do um, through, through classical biological control, uh, through, through conservation biocontrol. We have classical biocontrol, and I think this is one of the places where we get stuck the most, where essentially what we are asking the world to do, um, and I'm not quite sure why it's going ahead of me here, but anyway, um, it's making me speed up. That's Dan's way of making us finish on time. Um, <laughs> And, and this is really where we, where we do get caught, because what we're asking the world here is to set a thief to catch a thief. And often this is where um, uh, we, 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 we sit with problems around safety, we sit with problems around concerns, perceptions around safety. We also have the um, development of, of biopesticides, uh, which are pesticides derived from, from natural products, um, and we'll hear quite a lot about this. And then also, um, obviously, there is um, biostimulants as well, uh, substances, cultures, or microorganisms, um, and mixtures of materials used to promote um, uh, pr plant growth. But I really want to go back to the beginning, and um, you know, this is a, a slide that we would, we would show to our students. Um, and and I, th I just think it's important. I think it's important to set the scene, and in the coming slides, hopefully, you'll see why. So if we talk about classical biocontrol, and as I say, this is probably where we meet, we are met with, with, with some resistance, it's that we introduce these enemies, these, these plants, these um, animals from around the world in the absence of natural enemies, um, and they become problematic. And essentially, we go back to those areas um, to reintroduce those natural, those natural enemies. It sounds simple. Once again, going back to my opening, it has to be underpinned by, by, by strong um, uh, I I integrity of science, and everything is. But it's this slide that I, I really want to show people, because 
Um, we still get it today. We still get it in, in areas, I, I, I come from South Africa, we do a lot of classical biological control work in Africa. And yet there are still um, concerns about, um, do I have control of the mouse over here or here? It's doing its own thing. Um, and, 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 and really what I, what, what I want to point out here, uh, I do not have control of your mouse. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll paint the picture in, in, in words. So what we have on, 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 on the, the, the x-axis is population growth, uh, on, I mean time, and on the y-axis we have population growth. And you can see we have this high population, the white line, the high population of this invasive species. Um, this is, this is uh, you know, general, um, ge general ecology in the absence of, of, of the biological control agent. What we do in the, we try and set some form of damage threshold now, this is problematic straight away, and I think it's something that we need to concern. It's something that we probably haven't done well enough in biological control, is how do we set that damage threshold? How do we know when biological control is being effective? Is it the reduction... Oh, sorry, I'll get closer here. Is it, is it the <clears throat> increase in yield? Is it a, a, a decrease in the reliance on... Wow. Dan, you're giving me a challenge, eh? There we go. Okay, here we go. Great. Okay, so, so how we set this red line is, is, is really, really quite difficult, and I think it's a challenge uh, for, for, for biological control. The other thing that, the, and it's, it's, it, it really does sound simple, but it's something that we get hung up on. We release a biological control agent. The predictions are that it increases over time, and that over time we get this reduction, this natural reduction, in, in, our, in, in, in our pest species. But there's a couple of things that, that, that happen here, and it's something that um, becomes difficult for us to explain and difficult for us to get um, through not only um, uh, 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 the, the, the implementers of biological control, but also certain sectors of the scientific community. And the first is that we never drive this white line through the x-axis. And, and so you will have it, and I, and I, I know it sounds contrite, but people will say to you, well, what happens to the agent after all of the weed is gone or after all of the pest is gone? And, and, and we, we need to get better at selling that message is that it is a reduction in time. It isn't an eradication in time. So we don't push the white line through the x-axis. We don't, um, uh, uh, the, the aim is not to, um, to eradicate. Often the aim might just be to slow the spread of a particular invasive species. Um, and the other thing that's important here is time and how is time measured. And, and we, we say that you know, we measure time in, in, in biological control, um, not necessarily uh, in units of time, maybe in life cycles, but it does take time. And I think this, this, we've been really poor at, at selling that message. And the other thing that I think we've been really, really poor at is measuring this green line. I think we've been very poor at measuring the outcomes of a biological control program. So what happens when we get, when we've pushed the pest population through, through the red line, through the, through the threshold? Is there a return to a natural state, if it's an environmental weed we're trying to control? Or is there a reduction in the pesticide use, and is there an increase in yield if it happens to be a, um, a, a, a pest that we're trying to control? So these are some of the challenges that we as biological control practitioners, biological control scientists have. And I think we've, 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 we've been very good at saying, at measuring how bad things are, We've been less good at measuring how things recover um, post-biological control. And one of the other things that we've been really bad at, and this is the classic invasion curve, we've been really bad at where on the curve we intervene. And unfortunately, what we end up doing is intervening right at the end here. Sorry, I'm struggling with this, um, with this mouse. Right on the, on, 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 the end of the, on the end of the graph, when that particular invasive species, that particular pest has already become problematic. And we are very poor at intervening right in the beginning of the, um, of the, uh, of, of, of the invasion curve, uh, post-introduction or detection or when an invasive species is starting to move into its exponential curve. 
Something else that we've probably been not very good at, and I think we, we need to discuss, is, is well, you know, what is, the, what, what is the history of biological control? And it really does go back um, a long way. This was the first official introduction of a biological, classical biological control agent uh, for a cactus um, in the, what we would call the first classical biocontrol program, going back to 1913 with the control of um, Dactylopius salonicus um, in South Africa came about as, um, there's a long, long story about this. And many of us would have seen the classic photographs from Australia um, of the before and after photographs of um, Aphantia stricta. And we've been criticized for this. We've been criticized for these wonderful before and after photographs. But I can assure you, and I think that something that I spoke about in the introduction is we've got to stop talking to each other and talk to a far wider audience, is that this is all underpinned by years and years and years of, of, of science. What we have been good at is documenting what we do, and so we have um, catalogs, including this one uh, for the bi classical biological control of arthropods, the BioCat uh, catalog, which sits with, which sits with CABI, and Hayek has, has certainly looked at the different number of pathogens which have been released as biological control agents around the world. And we've also got the uh, so-called Winston catalog for the biological control of, of, of weeds as well. So we've been good at, at, at cataloging that. And I think that's really, really important because it shows that we that a level of transparency within biological control. That the, the information, the literature is out there. It's out there for, for all to see. I've said we've been bad at measuring things, and I, I, and I, I stand by that. I think we, 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 we are bad at measuring things, but we have measured some things. And um, this is some, obviously, the, the, the two classical biocontrol um, uh, programs in Africa, the biological control of cassava mealybug, and I'll talk a little bit about the biological control of water hyacinth on, on Lake Victoria. And this is really, really important that uh, when we're going forward is that it is the resource poor countries of the world that are going to rely more and more on classical biological control. And this is, this, this is really important. And so we have these, these great stories, um, and, and Chris Vakes could talk more about this, but the classical control of cassava mealybug and the cost-benefit ratio there, the classical biological control of water hyacinth. But I want to finish off with, with two examples that I hope will, will steer us in a, in, a, in a direction here. And they're two very small examples, but I think they're two very, very powerful examples. And this is a, a study that a, a resource economist um, student of mine did. And so we've got these aquatic weeds in South Africa. They come in, um, they cover the water surface, um, and they prevent any utilization of that water surface. They destroy the biodiversity under it. Uh, South Africa is a massive water problem, um, and abstraction becomes problematic. But we've got very good biological control on four of them, and um, going from your left to your right, Azolla, uh, Pistia, Myriophyllum, and, and Salvinia. And what I tasked Mary to do, now we've had classical biocontrol of these um, uh, uh, weeds for now 20 years, and they are under complete control. They're, in South Africa, these weeds are no longer problematic. They come from South America. We've introduced host-specific biological control agents. They are no longer problematic. And so what I tasked her to do is I said, in the absence of biological control, the government would have sprayed these plants. What was the pesticide, the herbicide saving over the last 20 years due to biological control. And she went off, I'm not numerate, she went off and she drew up all sorts of, all sorts of tables. And what she showed was that in the last 20 years that the South African government has saved over a billion rand in herbicide application due to biological control. Okay, putting that into, into your currency, um, that's um, some 48 million euros of herbicide. Now, it's not the money saving that's important here. It's the fact that that amount of pesticide has not been sprayed into our water bodies. We are really bad at measuring that biodiversity impact. But just on those four small projects, that has been the outcome. And I think that is really significant and some of the things that we need to bear in mind. The last example I just want to, 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 to finish off with, because I think one of the things we, we lack in biological control is, is poster children. We've, we've had the water hyacinth biocontrol on Lake Victoria, cassava mealybug, 
um, and, and some of the um, Australian acacia work. But we need new poster children. And uh, this is some work that we were involved with on a place called Lake Ossa um, in, in, uh, in, in, in West Africa, in Cameroon. And Lake Ossa uh, is completely covered by Salvinia molesta. Um, that is Salvinia that you can see, that you can see there. Um, and the, the reason why this is important is that it's one of the last uh, known refugia for the African manatee. So we all are desperate to save um, the black rhino uh, from extinction. We are all desperate to save um, um, uh, polar bears from extinction and panda bears from extinction. But what about the African manatee? One of the last few refugia for this large charismatic species. Um, and so we, we got involved in releasing a biological control agent. That is a picture of Salvinia under um, Certobagus, the insect that is eating it. We got started opening up areas, um, and we've got some camera traps out, um, and we're starting to see the return. And for me, and I know it's, it's trivial, but I always like to bring a little bit of humor into these things, that was significant because that is a manatee poo. And the fact that we've found manatee poo shows that the manatees might be coming back. So this is the power of biological control. In a resource-poor country that could not rely on anything other than biological control. We've had similar results in, in, in the Maasai Mara with the, the control of um, Histia. This is some work that, um, that Cappy have done there. What are the challenges? And I will finish off with just two slides. So the, the challenges are, are regulations, red tape. I think we, we, we acknowledge that. I think we're working on that. We are working on a better understanding of access and benefit sharing and how that fits into classical biological, uh, biological control. Safety, risk perceptions. And I put the picture of the cane toad. Anybody here who has worked in classical biological control, when you say to, and uh, it, it must have been the most amazing, amazing PR job that was done on the cane toads. Because whenever you say you talk about biological control, they say, but biological control is not safe. Remember the introduction of cane toads into Australia in 1935. 1935. We have come a long way since 1935. This is not an example of a classical biological control uh, program. Um, that's certainly not one that we would engage in, but it's one that we have to wear that is on our backs all the time. And so it's how do we overcome that perception that biological control is not safe? And that's something that we really have to work hard on. But just to conclude, um, if you look at this paper by George Hempel and Matthew Koch, um, they said that um, we went through about 100 years of a benefits era due to biological control, um, that everything was, was beneficial, but maybe some of the programs um, were not done the way that we would do them today. We entered a risk area where there was a huge um, uh, concern about the risk of biological control. We believe that we are now in a, a new paradigm where we've got an era where we can, we can, we can weigh up better um, the, uh, the benefits um, and the risks. And really, I think the final statement is that this twin requirement of increased demand for, for food and public pressure to produce food more sustainably, uh, sustainably means that we are really now in an era of necessity uh, for biological control. Thank you, Chair.